Good evening and welcome to this week's episode of Free Media, Free Minds, your CTV show where we look at issues of media freedom and the media in South Africa. Tonight we're going to be discussing media ethics, the kind of rules and principles that are supposed to guide journalism. With me in the studio I have Gay Davies from uh, SINEF, the Editors Forum, and Member of Parliament Ben Turok with the ANC. Uh, welcome, guys. Before we get started with our discussion, we're going to have a short look at an insert uh, unpacking media ethics. The ethical rules for journalists are probably relatively simple. It's not like a huge law book. Um, ultimately, it boils down to a few very simple things. You know, you don't lie and you don't cheat um, unless there may be very, very specific instances where, where that is the only way to really unearth something that is, that is of overwhelming public interest. Um, um, and, and there are some good international examples of how people would go in posed to be, you know, um, uh, a bookmaker or, a, or a, an arms dealer or whatever and actually manage to, to bring down corrupt ministers and so on. Basics are, are, are understood by all journalists. I'm not sure all journalists respect the basics. I've, I've seen some pretty bad things happen. People, when they're under a lot of pressure to produce and to produce now, they're much more likely just to take the press release handout, you know, quickly transcribe, there's my story, I'm done. Um, I fulfilled my quota, rather than to try and get to the bottom of, of, uh, of the story to find out, you know, who's really behind this and for what reason. Investigative journalism needs time and resources to succeed. You know, you've got to dig deeper, it takes, uh, it takes uh, real digging sometimes to get to your story. Now, the rise of new media, online media, while it's a great democratizer, and I love it for that reason, um, you find that it, it also encourages instant and, and often very cheap journalism. And uh, so that's inimical. What, what online, the rise of online journalism has also done is it has put pressure on traditional uh, print media. Um, media bosses uh, feel their margins squeezed, uh, they're selling less and less copies. What do, what do they do as they start, um, they start cutting jobs or they start putting more pressure on journalists to produce more in a shorter time with less resources? So all of these things work against, against investigative journalism um, and it's a worldwide phenomenon, certainly in South Africa but, uh, but worldwide. And I think, I think the solution is to find new ways to fund especially investigative journalism, non-commercial, non-profit ways. Um, that also uh, is, is, is good for another reason. It, it, it helps to, to uh, insulate journalists from, from the commercial interests that do, do have some, some uh, uh, indirect pressure. Right, let's get right into the discussion. Gay, what are some of the ethical principles that should guide professional journalism? Well, I think as you've heard Stefan saying in that in that insert, um, it's it's not uh, it's not a great complicated lexicon of laws. Um, it's essential rules that uh, should guide both the gathering of news, which is how you go about actually getting the information for your story, but also uh, in the printing of it um, and how it's presented in the newspaper. And I mean, your, your, your chief objective is to, be, is, to be, is to be fair. So you need, for example, to get uh, the comment from whoever it is you're saying something about or about whom other people are saying things about for argument's sake. You need to be, you need to be striving for maximum truth, which means not just simply taking the information given to you by a person about something and running it without it being checked and, and making sure that that is in fact the, the most accurate information. So, so verifying your facts and getting as many or at least the critical relevant sides of the story in. Ben, the ANC has been very critical of journalism in the country. Do you feel they're meeting this ethical standard that, that Gay is outlining? Well, let me first say, <clears throat> without any hesitation, that we need a press which is vigorous, which exposes corruption and misconduct. We need it very badly. And uh, I think that the whole of the ANC would stand by that statement. 
So let there be no doubt that a press which is going to expose uh, wrongdoing is very important. Does the press do it properly? Uh, the answer is in many cases no. I have before me the new press code and it's pretty good and it it talks about freedom of expression, it talks about being fair, it talks about not distorting news. 1.2.1 uh, says there should be no distortion, exaggeration or misrepresentation. Mm. Lovely sentence. Does the press do that? On the whole, no. And uh, maybe not on the whole, but I think on the whole often, it does. But uh, I think that there not are on the ethical whole. I, errors made. Yeah. No, I correct myself. Uh, I don't want to generalise, but there are too many instances when the press isn't fair. The main, my main uh, problem is with the headlines. Often a journalist does a reasonably good job and will represent what I say and others say fairly. But then the headline distorts the whole thing. And a lot of people are heavily influenced by the headline. Uh, they may read the story afterwards, but the headline has made the impact. And the, the, it seems to me that editors have a far greater responsibility about the headlines than about anything else, because it's the headline which counts. So, so again, Ben saying that on the whole, uh, journalists are behaving ethically and it's in fact the sub-editors that put the headlines together that he has a concern with. What's your sense? Are, are the codes of ethics alive in our newsrooms? I th look, I think, look, this, uh, let's, let's just home in now on, on, on the issues that sort of confront us sort of every day, all right? Because this is a framework, okay? That's what's required. It's like a game. You need rules of engagement. You need to understand what those rules are and the people who are playing the game need to really understand those rules and then you need a referee who's going to blow you up if you make an error or if you go against the rules. That's the big broad thing. As we all know with any game, people break the rules. Um, the play goes completely crazy, spectators get involved, things can go completely haywire. But generally everybody is in that game in order to try and play it according to the rules. right? The rules also aren't unchanging. They also need to be looked at and reviewed and they need to be changed according to the times. They can't yeah, just be set in stone. If, if, but if I'm not, I want to just make my point now. Um, daily, you've got people who are, who are putting together newspapers, thousands and thousands and thousands of words involved in that. And yes, you are going to have headlines which show a significant disconnect to the actual story, um, where the headline takes it into the, the, the realm of the beyond. It's a problem. It's a problem that any editor will tell you that they themselves um, need have to, are continually having to deal with. So you've got newspapers that are put together by a range of different people. So the journalist isn't responsible for the headline, and that's something journalists are most often having to explain to people that the headline was not written by themselves. The so yes, I would say no, you. Could, you there are two points I'd like to make. You, you, you consistently it, uh, having to having to work on there. work on on, no, on ethical two standards. Points. Firstly, this is not a game. It's a very serious business, and very often the morale of a country depends on what the newspapers do and say. Yeah. So I would say the uh, analogy of a game is not quite appropriate. Well, it it's a very an serious, very yeah. serious business. Secondly, uh, breaking the rules. You know, the editor is the man in charge, the chief executive, and I cannot accept that some middle-level manager who does the sub the headings, is allowed to get away with the kind of distortion we have. And, and my view is this, that because of economic problems and so on, sensationalism creeps in too quickly and the editor is in charge. I would like to see that there should be a place for sanctions against an editor who allows sensational headlines and reporting, scurrilous journalism, the editor should be held responsible okay. and gay there I'd love to sanctions. hear. Be there before, are sanctions before, before we get to the question of sanctions, do, what sanctions do, are you, would you, would you like to see? I don't know, but I would like to see that the editor is called to account in a serious okay. way. I'm not talking about prison sentences but the for the information bill. The editors <laughs> but, but are what, currently what would you be called to account about? by the press ombudsman 
and the press ombudsman can instruct uh, newspapers to publish an apology. Is yes, that but not you know, sufficient? I've been to the ombudsman with the Sunday Times. I have the papers here. The ombudsman is very tame. And I don't know why the ombudsman isn't fairer and even braver and even isn't more willing to, to act in the national interest and in the public interest. We have a problem. There's a kind of lethargy in the whole industry around truth. I mean, this document talks about the public interest, you know, very nice. Reasonable, uh, no, I've got it here somewhere, the public okay. interest. Uh, and the media generally make this point. My problem is that the press always, or journalists and editors, speak as though they're acting in the public interest, and very often they're not. They're acting in the interest of the profit of the journal, of the magazine or of the newspaper, and the commercial interest predominant over the national interest or the public interest. Yeah. Too uh, often. Gay, do, do you agree that well, commercial interests uh, put a pressure on journalists to behave unethically? No, I don't think that it's the journalist who's who's coming under who's coming under particular pressure in terms of in terms of the commercial interest. When you define commercial interests, you you might be saying um, that a newspaper is an entity it needs to sell in order to yeah. it is a, you know it, yeah. it, it's an, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a product up to a point. Yeah. Um, I agree with you that um, there's an absolute danger in in newspapers being seen as you know and sold as and operated as um, you might a company selling soap powder for argument's sake. It's a very different kind of entity that we're talking about here. I just want to pick up on the on the point that you made though about the, about the sanctions. I'm, I'm not sure what sanctions you'd like to see. Possibly editors in stocks in the town square with people <laughs> able to throw right. lettuces, Steady particularly on, people <laughs> wronged by <laughs> bad <laughs> headlines. Past that, but, several centuries ago. <laughs> but this is something that we've got to think about, you know, because in the and your comments about the press the press ombud being tame. I think if you look at the if you look at the ombudsman's decisions, I mean, people go and they complain. To the ombud and if you look at the recent record of the ombud I think you'll see um, the details of these of these investigations into people's complaints and you'll see the outcomes they do not by any means go in favor of the newspapers um, all the time at all and newspapers then have to publish an apology which I know uh, is often criticized as being you know that tiny little yeah. apology that's tucked away on page 16 that's just not the case actually it's not true um, it is the ombud who can say, you made the mistake on page one or the top of page three, and you need now to run your apology on page one, please, because that is where most people saw the story. Now, th th there are... Uh, for an editor to have to run a front-page apology is, is cringe-making, um, because for newspapers, I'd argue, um, their credibility is essentially their currency. People aren't going to buy a newspaper that they know is publishing information that is incorrect, and they get that information from what is published in the newspaper itself. And it has to so say, we I, are. So, Ben, you, argue, you arguing back? for yeah. stronger penalties, either financial or prison terms have been mentioned. Look, look, don't, don't you fear that that might put a chill on the free flow of information, encourage journalists to stick to reproducing press statements and covering celebrity news rather than going after the hard and controversial stories of corruption. We must be very careful and I'd be the first one to defend press freedom. And I do not want a, a, a legal mechanism which is going to do what you're suggesting. But the what, consequences what stronger are penalties do you have in mind that I would wouldn't like have to that see result? Us, I would like to see us together and that includes the ANC and the editors, sit down and say the present license for editors is too loose and we need to find a mechanism which calls them to account. But, but, you, but you yourself are saying most journalists do their job fairly well. I'm talking well. about editors in the first instance. Because edit, I want to go for the editors. Because the journalists on the whole, you know, it's okay. Although some of them overstep the bounds. And I don't want a police state. We know the consequences of that. Yes. But, you know, let me put it this way. In the ANC, there's a considerable feeling towards a, a tribunal. All right? There is a feeling. Mm. I think it's a mistake 
But the reason that people are urging that sort of thing is because we don't see signs that editors are being called to account. I could give you one example that happened two weeks ago, and I don't want to name the, journal, the newspaper. Something happened in Parliament, in my committee, and a newspaper published a story, and the headline was absolutely false. I phoned the editor of that paper and I said, I want a rebuttal tomorrow on the front page. Mm. It didn't happen. But what he did do is that three days later, he published another story giving the balanced account. Right. So I've left it. I'm not going to the ombud. Let's, let's leave it there. We're going to go to an ad break. You've been watching uh, Free Media, Free Minds on CTV. We're looking at journalistic ethics. Do journalists behave and conduct themselves in a professional way. The ANC is saying not, and there should be harsher penalties for journalists and editors. We'll pick it up after the break. Welcome back to Free Media, Free Minds. We're discussing media ethics in South Africa today. Um, Gabe, uh, from the Editors Forum, there's a perception that uh, journalistic standards in South Africa have been dropping over the years. Uh, ben is alleging that the problem is the editors. Have they been dropping and, and what is the real problem? I haven't done an independent measurement of, of, of standards, but I think it's safe to say that these days we've got newsrooms which have got uh, far fewer people. Um, we're not seeing as much resources put into training people uh, to staff those newsrooms. Uh, we're seeing people doing m many more than just the one job that they might have been doing 10 years ago. And I think that all of that is a very significant aspect of any discussion on ethics because you've got to look at that. Um, ultimately, ethics you can't really remove from the values that any one person brings to a particular place. The kind of moral culture that prevails all of that is going to feed into your ethics code. You can have a code, it can be shiny, it can say nice things, but it can be observed in the breach rather than, rather than as the rule. So then the commercial pressure, profit maximization and the drive to cut costs, slashing the newsrooms, seem to be driving and, and hampering quality journalism. How would penalizing editors address that? Look, there's no, no doubt that cutting staff, we see it in Parliament, the number of parliamentary correspondents reporting on Parliament has been reduced, which means the public don't know what's going on in Parliament because there's, there's no other way they can learn. Or if they do report it, the reporting is one-sided. For example, one of my big complaints about reporting in Parliament, it's, it's part of this thing, is that a journalist will come into a meeting in Parliament, a portfolio committee, put a tape recorder down and go to another meeting. So that tape recorder is listening to what the minister has to say, but the discussion is lost by and large. Yeah. And the report the next day will be what about the minister or the director general said, but not about the discussion. And the ANC calling for harsher penalties for journalists and editors? Well, you know, I, I don't want to be seen to be pushing for harsher penalties, but the present system is not good enough. Mm. And the standards about journalism are not good enough. And we see what happened in the UK. If you allow standards to drop to the level of the news of the world and the Daily Mirror and papers like that, and we've got a couple of papers in South Africa who are yeah. doing that kind of stuff, you can't allow that to go on. Yeah. And there must be some intervention. Yeah. How? I don't know. We need to discuss it. But intervention okay. is essential. This, uh, this, is okay. the, this is the new theme song now, is that the news of the world and the scandal of the journalists who were hacking into people's cell phones, absolutely nefarious conduct, totally to be condemned. Um, but it, it, it has handed uh, proponents of, of, of penalties and sanctions against, against no, the no, press Gay, here. You must be something fair. Something on the platter. You must be fair. If you look at the front page, of voice okay, but and other papers, but the point, you'll see what I'm talking about. But the point about. I want, to, the point I want to make, the point, criminal misconduct, 
by journalists no, in no, South I'm not African talking about recent years. I'm talking about prejudiced reporting. Look, but the let, code let, let says... Just, let me just go back and make the point about the news of the world, because I think that the problem there isn't so much that you've got a newspaper, a news of the world, with declining standards. The problem there is that the owner of News of the World and any number of other media outlets in Great Britain, uh, in the UK, um, assumed such influence and power, not only over the government, um, but, I mean, also the police were complicit in, in, in covering up for them. The and the that's the but, problem. But I, yeah, does but the ANC have a that. case when it says that it's being unfairly and systematically misrepresented? I think so. I think there is prejudice uh, among many uh, journalists and editors against the ANC. And let me say right away that a lot of there is misconduct, and we read this in the newspaper on a regular basis. Too many people in senior positions are behaving badly on corruption and various other issues. We, we don't want that hidden. In fact, I myself, as a member of parliament, depend on the newspapers to inform me when some senior person has engaged in, in wrongdoing. Okay. But let me go back to the front page story. I'm not, I wasn't referring to the phone tapping and all that. I'm talking about the sensational cover, front yes. page. There are newspapers in Cape Town who are uh, constantly harping on sexual things, who are um, very sensationalist, cheap stuff. And the masses are buying it. And that's what I'm talking about. And, and too many newspapers are leaning in that direction as if that they, they feel they have to toe the line and, and be popular around those sensational issues. That's my problem. And the editor is the one who's responsible. So, so Gay, we have had one, one example a couple of years ago in Cape Town where journalists did receive money to cover a story. To what extent do you find these kind of pressures on journalists? You said ethics is very much about the values of individual journalists. And within the newsroom. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's within the newsroom. It's, it is also the, the, the domain, obviously, of individual editors. This is what allows people who feel that they've been wronged to come and complain to the ombudsman and to say, this article, like you would have done, um, Ben, with the, you know, with, uh, you know, with the, you could have, if, if you'd not had any any redress from the editor of Business Day, you would have been able to go to the ombud and say this take? is unfair. How long would it turnaround take? Turnaround times have been reduced dramatically, the, really significantly. I think that it needs to be acknowledged. Are you going to that encourage has me been, to do that? <laughs> and I would encourage everybody to do it. I would encourage everybody to do it. You know, I often have uh, discussions with people in government within the ANC, you know, who will complain about something and say, please lay a complaint about it. Because if you've not had any kind of joy with dealing directly with a person, please lay a complaint. Personally, I feel, and I'm speaking for myself now, um, an error is made, you get that correction in as quickly as you possibly can. I'm talking about a factual error where, you know... You can I give you an example, Kay? You, you can I correct give an it example? immediately. Can I give you an example? In a newspaper a few days ago, there was a headline about MPs doing uh, MPs do this and that, you know, it's always wrong, you know, bad things. MPs are corrupt, MPs this, etc. Now, <clears throat> it's a distortion, because among the MPs that I work with, there are plenty of good people, plenty of honest people. You know, the whole thing isn't corrupt, but the headline says MPs. The suggestion is that all, all MPs. MPs yes. All right. Now, what do you want me to do? You want me to write to the ombud and say that headline is factually incorrect. Well, you but first take it up with, it with, with, the, with the editor. is the notion of balanced and fair a bit of a myth in an unequal society such as ours? The well, me, but the they, they claim, they claim that that is what motivates them. Look but, at this. But could they in ever the be? Isn't what's missing in the South African media a diversity of media so that they're people telling the story from the point of view of the ANC sure. and the point of view of social movements rather than... Sure, but who's going to pay for it? Um, and the advertisers won't advertise in such a paper. Right. Uh, let me just show you, say to you, there are two clauses in this code referring to the legitimate public interest. Hmm. You see, the, bearing in and mind... And who decides the public interest? Well, it's here. That's a debate. It's no. here. That's a debate. It's here. The yeah. point is this, that I would like the editors to, be, to explain to us how they and their newspaper defends, quote, 
the legitimate public interest. Or how they okay. define it in the first place. Okay. Well, you're, you're a, and that's a, you're that's an a debate that you... That a very powerful group. Well, how do you I'm interpret a, I'm, a, I'm a deputy interest. political editor of the Independent Newspapers mm. Group and, and also SANEF Sec Secretary General. But um, I, I'll, give you, I'll give you examples. Mm, um, there, was, um, there, was a, there was a story which I saw uh, coming through which related to a politician, a well-known politician, um, who was having a distressing divorce. Um, and this story contained details of the of the nature of that of that divorce and this was a story that was that was heading for publication and I queried it and I said what is the interest in the details of, of this person life. of this couple's you know distress and misfortune in arriving at this divorce and yeah. But now let's just think I'm about it, because if you've, got, if you've got if you've got a person who is, sim you know, there was no public interest in it because it yeah. was just simply two people. And, but and if he'd mature... been, if he'd been like some of the American politicians are very big on family values, and the reason his yeah. wife was divorcing him was because he was having yeah. an affair with an underage girl, then there's I, public I, interest, I think, and uh, then you publish. I think you're so, giving us an example of a mature South African journalist using her integrity to interpret the ethics to behave like a professional. Well, what we're trying to do. It doesn't happen all the time and I'm still left wondering whether South Africa has a problem of a lack of ethics or whether this is just a ploy by those who aren't happy with the consistent negative portrayal I've latching heard. on and, and uh, creating the context in which we can justify penalties for journalists which will inevitably have a negative impact on the free flow of information in society. Unfortunately, Ben, we're going to have to leave it there for today. We'd love to have you back on the show in the coming weeks. Uh, you've been watching Free Media, Free Minds, brought to you by Cape Town TV, Alternative Information Development Center, and the Friedrich Ibert Stiftung. Thank you for being with us, and we look forward to seeing you next week. All the best. I have